All right, in this video, I want to show you a schematic model of the Cas9 protein and introduce some terms that are going to seem strange to you in the beginning, but you will you'll you'll come to recognize what a spacer is, what tracer RNA is, repeat RNA, viral DNA, and then the Cas9 protein. So here's the complex assembled. Let's take it apart to begin with. Let's put this viral DNA up here. And we'll actually get rid of the guide RNA for just a second. And we'll look just at the, at the protein. So this is the Cas9 protein. It's a very large protein. It's a schematic model, of course. It's an endonuclease, meaning it has an active site, two active sites. One that will cut what we call the target strand, one of the two strands of double-stranded DNA. The other one cuts the non-target strand, all right? So it's an endonuclease, but it doesn't just run around loose in a cell cutting any DNA that it finds. That would be disastrous. So this Cas9 is programmed by RNA to only cut DNA which is exactly complementary to the first 20 nucleotides of what we call CRISPR RNA, okay? And you see the first 20 nucleotides are purple, and then the next few nucleotides are colored black. This represents repeat DNA. This is spacer DNA. This is complementary. The purple part is complementary to viral DNA. Okay, this is repeat. This is uh, CRISPR. This is a short palindromic repeat. Does that ring a bell? CRISPR is regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. That's what the acronym stands for. This black part right here is to represent that short palindromic repeat that is interspersed, interspaced with these 20 nucleotide long spacer sequences, which represent viral sequences. All right, so it's not just this RNA, this guide, this guide RNA doesn't work all by itself. It has to have what's called a transactivating RNA, which we represent here in orange, and the tracer or transactivating RNA. It has some secondary structure. So here's an AU base pair, a GC, GC, AU. So the the base pairing that's inherent in this tracer RNA creates these hairpins, these sort of two-dimensional hairpins. And of course, this is not two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. We can't model the third dimension in this very schematic model. But we have the tracer RNA here. And the key here is that the three prime end of the tracer RNA is again complementary to the five prime end, I'm sorry, the five prime end of the tracer is complementary to the three prime end of the repeat here. So you get this dual RNA. You get tracer RNA, you get CRISPR RNA. Purple and black together is known as CRISPR RNA. And this RNA, which collectively is called guide RNA, the guide RNA now programs the endonuclease to only cut a double-stranded DNA sequence if it can find a stretch of 20 nucleotides that exactly matches this spacer. All right, that's the magic of Cas9. So this then is a sequence which represents a piece of viral DNA. So you might think that this Cas9 somehow starts here and it starts checking the sequence to see if it's complementary to the purple. And of course, if it's off by even one nucleotide, it won't be complementary. So you might imagine that this nuclease has a really tough job of looking one by 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 one all the way down this DNA. But the system is, is much more sophisticated than that because it has evolved so that this Cas9 protein only binds to what's known as a PAM sequence. So there's a, there's a section in this protein, which we've labeled here, the PAM recognition site. And PAM, what is PAM? 
PAM stands for Protospacer Adjacent Motif. Terrible name. Uh, and to understand why it's called that, you're going to have to listen, watch Mark Holzer's video that he's going to do that's going to put this protein in the broader context of the adaptive immunity system in bacteria. So you're not going to learn everything you need to know in any one of these videos. You're going to have to get a little piece of information from this one, put it together with Mark's, go back and forth, and in a week or so you'll be a CRISPR expert. But this is the PAM site. For Cas9, the PAM site is, in fact, NGG. What does that mean? It means any nucleotide followed by GG. So when you're looking at a sequence like this, what you're looking for was two consecutive G's and then any base that comes in front of those G's. And when you find that, so here's a PAM site, here's an NGG. So we're going to place that right over the PAM recognition domain. Now before we go any further, let me point out that there's a PAM site here. It's also a PAM site here in the bottom strand. But if I turn this around, turn this over this way, here's a PAM site, here's a PAM site, here's a PAM site, there's a PAM site at the very end here. So the point is the Cas9 protein will bind sort of randomly at each one of these PAM sites. And then it asks, it starts comparing the sequence on the opposite strand, a strand opposite this PAM site, uh, to see if it's complementary to the purple strand. And if it isn't, then it'll let go and it'll try another PAM site and another PAM site going in both directions. So it just sort of sort of docks onto releases, docks onto and releases. And it's a rare event when it finally finds the right PAM site so that the sequence that it's adjacent to the PAM site is in fact complementary to the purple guide RNA. All right, so let's imagine that this is the right PAM site. It docks or binds right here. The next thing that happens then is the Cas9 protein will separate these two strands of DNA. So now we have what we call the target strand and the non-target strand. And as soon as it separates, it then interrogates the target strand to see if it is, in fact, complementary to its guide RNA. And sure enough, in this case, you can see that there's an exact match of complementary AT and GC base pairs all the way along this 20 nucleotide stretch of spacer DNA. So that then tells the Cas9 protein, okay, I found the right target. There's a conformational change that activates this nuclease site so that you cut the non-target strand. It also activates this nuclease site so that you you cut the target strand, the guide RNA releases, and just like that, you have generated a double-stranded cut in this viral DNA. So if this were viral DNA from a virus that's trying to infect the bacteria, and if this bacteria had encountered that virus previously, say last year, then the CRISPR system would have acquired this spacer, which allows it to remember that this virus had tried to infect it and kill it previously. So now this provides a bacteria with an immunity system, one that will recognize the sequence and cut it. And once you've cut it, you've effectively destroyed the new incoming virus. Uh, Imagine that this was a critical gene encoding a critical protein that the virus needs to replicate. You just cut it, you've activated that gene, you don't make that viral protein, you don't make virus. Okay. So this is how Cas9 works in the bacterial immunity system. And again, Mark Holzer is going to do a video in which he will put this protein in the broader context of that adaptive immunity system. So watch for that. But the last thing I want to do is I want to back up then and I want to show you 
what you've all been waiting for, and that is base editing. <clears throat> this is how CRISPR works in bacteria. People like David Liu have taken this Cas9 protein out of the bacteria, and they've modified it, <clears throat> two significant modifications that makes it useful in base editing. So let me show this. Let's go ahead and set this up so it's bound to the Cas or to the PAM site. We've interrogated the uh, the target strand, <clears throat> and as a result of that, we have confirmed that we have found a specific piece, specific sequence. <clears throat> and remember now, this is not bacterial immunity. We now have this purified enzyme. We have this enzyme out of bacteria and we're trying to use it to target a specific sequence in the human genome. And what we want to do is we want to edit the base. And in particular, we want to edit this base right here. So we're going to turn this C over. All right. So of the 3.2 billion bases, base pairs, 6.4 billion bases in the human genome, we can bind Cas9 specifically to one. And then we've done two things to the Cas9. Number one, we've inactivated both of these nuclease sites. I'm going to say we've inactivated both of them. And that is all you need to know for the first few tournaments, Science Olympiad protein model in tournaments that you go to. Ultimately, you're going to learn that they only inactivated that one. But to begin with, we're going to say they inactivated both of them. In the first generation base editor, they inactivated both of them. So the Cas9 can bind, but it can't cut. But we want to modify that C to a U. So here's the magic. This is cytidine deaminase, a schematic model of the protein you're going to model as your pre-build. So what, what David Liu and his group have done is they've tethered the cytidine deaminase protein to the Cas9 protein. And you do that by simply joining together the C-terminal end of the cytidine deaminase, which is a small protein, to the N-terminal end of Cas9, which is a big protein. And this, the N-terminal end of Cas9 is in the general vicinity of the single-stranded non-target DNA containing the base that you want to edit. So now the linker here that tethers cytidine deaminase to Cas9 allows this thing to kind of swing around and specifically bind to and chemically modify this cytidine base, deaminating it, taking an amino group off, converting it to a U and then ultimately that U will become a T with DNA replication. So that, in a nutshell, is base editing. You use a dead Cas9 that can't cut, but can still target. And what you're really targeting to this site is a deaminase that's positioned just so that it can recognize and bind to a specific C and convert it to a U. So if this is a single point mutation responsible for a human genetic disease, you can correct that base without ever cutting the DNA and having to worry about all of the unintended consequences of having cut, made a double-stranded cut in a gene. You've simply surgically repaired the C, changing it to another base. That's the whole I've given the whole thing away now. This is base editing. And in the pre-builds, you're going to model this protein. You're going to learn all about the first generation base editor. And then there's a second, third, fourth. There's probably a fifth and sixth generation base editor by now. All right. Good luck with this story.